like, you know, so like we came here for one thing and one thing only. And we're, fresh, <laughs> we're fresh out of bubble gum or whatever. I don't know if you that lineup, but whatever. I don't care. It's fine. I love, I love, I love you. I love bubble gum. I love movies. I love you too. I love they live. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's a good movie. So what I'm, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna like pre-record like the opening where it's gonna say like. Uh, Inspired by Sight and Sound and IMDb, two guys set out to do the top 250 list. I'm going to put that like pre-recorded on each episode. Okay. That sounds good. All right. So we are back with episode five yeah. of the miniseries, yeah. the top 250. Joining me again is Tom. So thanks for being Hello. here again. And we have quite the list going. Today we're starting with 150, correct? Yep. And then we're going to go to 126. 150 to 126. Okay. At least that's what I have in my box. So <laughs> I can't remember who went first last time. Uh, I think I went first last time. So you want to go All first? All right. I will go. Yeah. At my 150. Do it. Is a music film. Do it. Yeah. Music film. Crazy Heart starring Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges finally got his best Oscar for this he plays all the songs a lot of original music singing he plays an alcoholic country singer and maggie gyllenhaal plays a love interest pretty good movie and i have some memories of going to see it in theaters my grandma who passed away and she really loved a couple of the songs in this so i always liked this movie and robert duvall also shows up the next one is 149 and one that i skipped class for few times to go see if you can believe it grand torino by clint eastwood this movie is uh a rare movie where clint eastwood plays a basically a racist and grumpy man who finds peace in the neighbor who he warms up to and finally decides to show a little soft side and defend his neighborhood and his car in grand torino that's a good one. Also directs. Yeah. It is good. 148 is Rob Williams. Good morning, Vietnam. Not only could Rob Williams play a comedy, and he goes full blown Rob Williams here by improvising most of the scenes, it also becomes a drama. It's a Vietnam drama at times. So it's a very touching uh performance here and a great movie filled with some awesome songs from the 60s and 70s. Really enjoy this movie. 147 is one that you had earlier. I think last episode, possibly. Uh, Misery. Mm -hmm. James Kahn plays an author who is kidnapped by a super fan played by Kathy Bates. And it's a small, dramatic thriller that I think is highly effective. Really enjoyed this one. I enjoyed them all, guys. Well, yeah, what? Yeah, why would they would be on the list, right? So, yeah, um, 146 Goodfellas, Scorsese's uh, gangster epic. Love the first two acts of this film, not a big fan of the final act. I know it's based on a true story. I just, whenever Joe Pesci dies, I kind of lose it, loses a little bit. So, but, anyways, it's a still a great film, and that one is always a classic. and all right, so that's my first five. What do you have, Tom? All right. Um, my number 150 is The Innocence, 1961, an adaptation of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James, the story of a governess haunted by ghosts. I love how they present the ghosts with fog and how they appear or just sit in scenes. I also appreciate that they kept the novel's downer ending. Number 149 is one that I know that you love, um, Anna the Apocalypse. <laughs> Anna is dealing with wanting to take a gap year and the recent death of her mother when the zombie apocalypse begins, a Scottish Christmas zombie musical. I just love this movie, a Christmas favorite. Dad doesn't like the movie. It's a, it's a, that was a joke. I like the <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm you have to yeah, yeah. 
Uh, number 148 is Don't Look Now. Nicholas Rogue adapts uh, Daphne du Maurier in stylish fashion. Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie are in Venice following the death of their daughter. Christie falls in with a psychic who claims to see their daughter's ghost, while Donald starts seeing a little girl in a red raincoat under the canals and believes it is the ghost of their daughter. Atmospheric and beautiful, moving with a shocking ending. This is a well-made and realistic haunted house movie as The Exorcist. Wow. Yeah. No, this one's really good. I have one more Nicholas Rudd movie on here. Okay. Uh, number 147 is Touch of Evil, recreated director's cut. Uh, Orson Welles dire directs and stars as a corrupt cop on the Texas-Mexico border. Charlton Heston plays a Mexican officer investigating a bomb placed in the trunk of a car that crossed the border before exploding. A dark and feeling film noir, one of my favorites. Uh, I've not actually seen the other cuts of this film, but I I, I always go back to the uh, recreated director's cut. So, Yeah, that's Orson's uh, intended vision. Yeah, exactly. And, like, we don't have that on a lot of his films. I mean, like, a lot of them were just censored. Like, The Lady yep. from Shanghai, um, The Magnificent Ambersons. We don't have his version of the movie. It's We just have what the studio put out. Yeah, studio interference. That's why he but, left Hollywood. Yeah, but this is the complete list of edits that Orson left behind that they used to recreate the director's That's set. the memo. Wow. Yeah. So... I give him props because yeah, I have the I have all that. three cuts and I have the Kino 4K, but doesn't include the memo. Wow, it shows it on the screen. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's interesting. It doesn't. You know, I haven't read the whole thing because, like, it is just essentially a series of like, here's what I want out of this scene. Yeah. <laughs> but it is interesting flipping through because it is Orson Welles saying it. So, like, it it it, it it's interesting. I like it. Um. I'm going to guess you have this one higher, but um, so my 146 is um, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. It's part of my The Man with No Name collection. Uh, Sergio Leone's quintessential Western starring Clint Eastwood as the man with no name. He and two others are on the hunt for a treasure buried in a grave and are willing to cross each other to get it. Epic suspenseful with a wonderful Ennio Morricone score. This film captures the best of the, sp the spaghetti westerns have to offer. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, surely I think that's the best spaghetti western, like hands down. I don't think there's like even, it's like even close. Um, I mean, there's some other really good films. Don't get me wrong, but I just think the good, the bad, and the ugly is the perfect spaghetti western. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and I'm differentiating that from like other westerns. I think you could make an argument for like you know other westerns being better if you wanted to, um, but specifically the the italian westerns yeah it's its own uh, genre or subgenre yeah. um Good. so yeah all right my 145 is a comedy classic the Nutty, the original nutty professor by jerry mm -hmm. lee lewis he plays a bumbling professor who becomes of this formula that makes him more attractive and turns him into buddy love where he falls for Stella Stevens. And at first it was kind of awkward because I thought it was high school, but it turns out it's college. So I was okay with it. And um, yeah, it's, it's a very colorful film, uh, very much of its time from the 60s and uh, slapstick humor that Jerry Lee Lewis is famous for. He also directed. Oh, yeah. 144 is Rear Window, my Ooh. favorite Hitchcock film. Love this movie. Uh, it's got some great cast. James Stewart uh, leads the cast, and it's just such a suspense-driven uh, mystery. This guy is basically a uh, house-ridden, and he finds figures out this murder. And it's just it's the way that uh, Hitchcock lays out the clues and suspense, just masterful. One forty-three is Smokey and the Bandit. Burt Reynolds has a lot of fun in this one as the uh, bandit. He is just, you know, basically it's a high speed chase a la Mad Max Fury Road. And there's a lot of interesting uh, car stunts in here. 
And Sally Field shows up as a bride who left her wedding. So there's a lot of comedy too. So I just thought it was a great 70s flick that I saw, you know, later on and, and probably five years ago was the first time I saw it after Burt Reynolds died. Uh, they were doing a showing and I went and saw it. It was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Next one, 142 is based on a true story. Ron Howard directs Apollo 13 with uh, Tom Hanks at the helm here. Bill Paxton, Kevin Bacon, Gary Sinise, Ed Harris, loaded cast. The true story about Apollo 13. They were on a mission to the moon, but it, they're, they're, uh, they had a problem. Used to have a problem, and they had to figure out a way to get back home safely, alive. And uh, so, yeah, it's just this really, uh, really great true story here by Ron Howard. And speaking of Tom Hanks, 141. I think this one's dropped quite a bit on my list from the one that we did eight years ago or whatever, whenever that was. Forrest Gump. Still really like this film. I think it's yeah, it's one that I grew up on. Really enjoyed Tom Hanks' performance and all of the, I guess, satires and historical references in here. Like John Lennon shows up. You know, we have JFK. We have, uh, and then you have the love story. Which is kind of one-sided. I feel sorry for Forrest. He's chasing after Jenny, and she gives in to him, and has like a one-night stand, and gets pregnant, and leaves him again. So it's just like, all right, Forrest, you've done all this amazing stuff. You deserve better. And uh, but yeah, still a great movie by Robert Zemeckis. She's she's going through some stuff. That's true. That's true. All right, back to you. Okay. I think cool. right. Sorry, I always get like lost in your list, and then I'm like, oh, right, I gotta go. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, uh, my 145 is The Changeling 1980. Following the death of his Ooh, wife and daughter, it. George C. Scott moves into a large, crumbling house haunted by the ghost of a murdered child. Solving the child's murder gives Scott closure on his own tragedy. A beautiful yet scary film, well paced, well executed, and well acted. Scott brings incredible pathos to the role. This is like honestly, like this is one of my favorite Scott uh, George C. Scott like roles too. Um, like I don't have Patton on here, um, but like I have this one. I I love what he does with this. Like I haven't he, seen that one. They um they put out a 4K. Um, this is a uh, Severin. I get Severin confused with like vinegar syndrome, but um, but they put out a 4K. I have not gotten that yet, but I I already had the Blu-ray, so I was like, all right, it's a great cover. Yeah, no, it's a great cover. Um, I think, yeah, the inside is like red. Yeah, I do. Um, they didn't restore the um opening credits when they did it. I what? was a little, you will know, like some of the like Severin and um Vinegar Syndrome sometimes do that where they don't like restore the opening credits. So I was a little disappointed with that because like there's a noticeable drop in quality for those. Hmm. Um which is weird because like there's picture in it. So like you think like I understand not doing it if there's no picture. Mm -hmm. You know, like but when there's picture I'm like why are you what whatever I mean like it's a it's a small gripe but yeah okay then number one forty four is Amadeus oh, yeah. uh, Milos Forman brings the Broadway play to the screen F Murray Abraham plays Salieri secret rival to Mozart who undermines him at every turn vividly depicting the court slash opera intrigues in seventeenth century Vienna it is a fantastic film about artistic jealousy and bitter simpering hatred. Yeah, I finally saw that film last year. It's good. It the first time, the director's cut. So. Yeah, well, I don't like that was the only one that's on here, so I haven't actually seen the theatrical cut. I did read up online the changes, and so I guess the scene where he intends to blackmail um, Mrs. Mozart for sex um, is not in the um, theatrical cut. And I'm just kind of like, he was a piece of shit before this. Like, I, this doesn't really change my opinion of him that much. Um, right. I get why some people would be like, oh, that's a step too far if you didn't see that the first time. Um, but. Yeah, he's still a creep. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, like, 
I, I I have only seen this version, so I can't really like put myself in the headspace of someone who saw the theatrical version and then saw that ad and scene and was shocked by it. I can understand like why you would be, um, but for me, I was just like, oh well, he's an asshole. Like I mean, like <laughs> he's fascinating to watch. Don't get me wrong, but he is an asshole the ruin through the entire time. So like that, you know, doesn't change anything much for me. Right. Okay, my um, one forty three is brawl in cell block ninety nine. Vince Vaughn is a good man who turns to crime, and his goodness in crime lands him in jail. Once there, he is told he must commit an assassination in a high security prison, or else his pregnant wife will be killed. Intense and physically visceral, Vaughn transforms into the role, unleashing brutal strength upon everyone who gets in his way. Yeah, and uh, I like this director. What's his name? Uh, S. Craig Zauer. He's made three movies. Uh, Bone Tomahawk was the first one. This was number two. And then the third one was uh, Dragged Across Concrete. This is my favorite of the three. Um, but the other the other two are really good, too. Especially Dragged Across Concrete. Yeah. Bone Tomahawk may grow on me. I think it's okay. Uh, number 142. Apocalypse Now, the final cut. Uh, quietly going mad in Saigon, Martin Sheen is tasked with going out into the wilderness of Vietnam to kill a rogue U.S. commander, Colonel Kurtz, who has set himself up as a cult leader. Francis Ford Coppola's mad river journey is a feast for the senses and a nightmare for the imagination. Marlon Brando gives an unsettling turn as the mad Colonel Kurtz. Well said. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Mad river epic, or whatever you said. <laughs> Yeah. Oh well, yeah, it's a it's a hallucinatory film. It is. I mean, it is. like, and the the I think the final cut just kind of adds to that. Like, I feel like the theatrical cut and the final cut are very like weird and crazy. The redux, the pacing is so off. The movie just comes to a grinding halt right in the middle when they go to the French plantation. The final cut is good because it like kind of incorporates those scenes, but they don't stop the movie. They just add what they're meant to add, and then they move on. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that he did a really good job with that one. Um, the Redux, I can't watch. I, I, I can't get through it. But um, the final cut, I think, is really well done. And then number 141 is Brazil. Terry Gilliam's sci-fi dystopian masterpiece stars Jonathan Price as a low-level bureaucrat caught up in an attempt to capture an, an illegal AC repairman played by Robert De Niro, instigated by a typo. Surreal and hilarious, yet pessimistic. Wow, what a movie. Uh, Catherine Helmond of Soap's role... Uh, of Soap... Soap's role... Catherine Helmond of Soap's role as, Ka as Price's mother, who is addicted to plastic surgery, is darkly hilarious. This is my first time seeing her outside of soap, so I was like real excited when she showed up. <laughs> well, she's so funny on soap. Um, I, did, have you heard of soap? I have. Billy Crystal. Yeah. yeah, I love that show. He's not even like the main character, but he was like one of the main characters. Yeah, I heard about it in History of Television, that class. Yeah, he's the first openly gay character on television. Oh, really? Yeah. I guess I wasn't they, that close. They, they uh they they treat him with like a, a lot of pathos. So um it, it's funny too, like they have conversations where they're explaining um being gay to like other characters, and then they react and their reactions are just really funny. So like they're explaining to um uh Catherine Helmond who plays um She's she's Billy Crystal's aunt on the show, and she's an idiot. Like that's her entire character. She's an idiot. She has no idea what's going on. Although they do make a really good like every so often when she realizes someone is like being a dick to her, like her husband is cheating on her. Mm -hmm. um, they really have like a good pathos moment. But um, she um, <laughs> they have this conversation where they're talking about um, uh where he says Plato is gay, like the, the Greek scholar. Yeah. And she takes a second and then she says, 
Mickey Mouse had a gay dog. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's funny. Okay. All yeah, right, one forty. Huh? You got to go on with your list. Uh, it's like, it's like a oh, that's all good, man. One forty is James Mangold directed Ford versus Ferrari. I'm sorry, Matt Damon and Christian Bale. Really, I love the uh, story here. It's based on a true story. Set in the 1966 and the Le Mans race. Um, great performances here by Matt Damon and Christian Bale, and s- strong direction by James Mangold. Um, I always love his films. Oh, yeah. Next one, 139 is Glory, starring Matthew Broderick, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman. This is about the first black regiment for the North and Civil War. It's a very uh, powerful film and important film, I believe, that still holds up today. James Horner's score is amazing. And the direction by Edward Zwick is, I mean, it's just above and beyond. It's one that I really, I've seen it, I saw it in middle school the first time in a history class. I really enjoyed it. All right, 138 is It Happened One Night, starring Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert. This is a slapstick comedy, romantic comedy that still holds up today. I think it's it's a highly charming film, especially on this new uh, 4K release from the Sony collection. Really enjoyed it. Uh, there's the old artwork. So I like the old artwork. I do too, yeah. 137. True Grit, the remake of the Coen Brothers. I actually prefer this a lot more to John Wayne's original. Oh, yeah. Fantastic story. Uh, I think it's more true to the book. I haven't read the book, but I've heard that they went more true to the novel. And just fantastic performances here. Haley Steinfeld came out of came out here and put herself on the map as an actor. And Jeff Bridges, Matt Damon, Josh Brolin are in here. And typical Coen Brothers uh, wit here and, and cinematography is just fantastic 136 is before sunrise mm. richard linklater uh directs uh ethan hawk and julie delphi in the first movie uh where two strangers meet on a train and spend the night together before sunrise of course but and then they have to part so it's just a nice little slice of life movie uh Sort of like a, they have some interesting conversations about sexism, feminism, and where they are in life. And it's just, you can feel the bond between the two of them. Then they have to part. So it's kind of like a little uh, romantic, little comedy, a little bit of everything. One that I try to watch every Valentine's Day. Hmm. You had uh, one of the other ones on there already. Was it uh, Before Midnight? Did I? I might have. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't remember that, but uh... I thought so, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe <laughs> I'm scrolling okay. now. I don't see any. Uh, I know they're on here. Oh yeah, I assume you had all three on them. All three of them on there. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, no, I don't. I think I started with the original. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> so my 140 is The Fly, 1986. David Cronenberg's remake of the 50s film finds Jeff Goldblum degenerating into a half man, half fly, half man after a mistake with his teleportation pod. Cronenberg's most mainstream body horror movie emphasizes the tragedy of Goldberg's lost human- Goldblum's lost humanity. I, I wrote these out on paper, so sometimes... <laughs> sometimes I can't read my own writing. And also, you did, I did this did like great. a month ago. <laughs> did great. Sounded great. Hell yeah. Good pick. 139 is Drive. Ryan Gosling stars in Nicholas Winding Refn's crime drama. 
As a stuntman who moonlights as a getaway driver, the original music becomes the film's heartbeat as the driver's a tragedy and beautifully made, simply acted. The film almost feels like the driver's dreams of his life as he dies. Spoilers. <laughs> you said it feels like his dream? Yeah, almost in a way. Like, feels kind of dreamy, right? That's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. I don't know. That's what I was thinking of the last time we watched it. I don't think I said that out loud. But uh, <laughs> okay, and then number one thirty-eight is the death of Stalin. Armando Anucci's creator Veep brings his political comedy stylings to the power struggle among Stalin's yes men following the dictator's death. Hilarious, dark, intricately paced and plotted, a delight of a movie that ends with a main character being burned alive. Nice. Okay, number 137 is Moonlight. Told across three points in a young man's life, following him from poverty to post-prison life as he struggles with his mother's drug addiction, bullying, and his own sexuality. Naomi Harris and Mahershala Ali give tremendous supporting performances. Ray Jenkins' direction is first class. Agreed. Yeah. Number 136, The Black Phone. Scott Derrickson adapts the short story by Joe Hill. A young boy is kidnapped by a pedophilic murderer, played by Ethan Hawke, but receives aid from the ghosts of this previously murdered boys who can communicate him via an unplugged phone in the basement dungeon. Great child acting by the two leads, a wonderful recreation of the 1970s, and a triumphant finale. Cool. All right. Well done. I have 135. Coming in at 135 is Five Easy Pieces, starring Jack Nicholson, directed by Bob Ralphson, who directed him several times over the years. It's a uh, very much a... Uh, I don't want to ruin the twist, but there's a nice twist if you stay with the movie. It's kind of a slow-paced movie, but if you stick with it, you figure out why... Nicholson's character is the way he is in a fantastic reveal. Next one is 134. My favorite Argento. Suspiria. Haunting score. Amazing cinematography and suspense. Just a, a beautiful giallo. Really enjoyed it. Really brief. <laughs> But uh, 133, Shrek, hey now, you're an all-star. This is a great movie. I still think it's hilarious. And um, the animation's a little dated, but uh, I really have a good time with this fantasy. Uh, I guess it's almost a parody of like... It's it's a parody. Yeah, yeah. I would say I mean, nice. there was some visceral aimed at Disney for that one. <laughs> That's true. I definitely can see it. And uh, yeah, it's a great time. Mike Myers, Eddie Murphy, Cameron Diaz, lead the John Lithgow, Farquad. I can't forget him. Mm. Good stuff. Next one is a classic from my childhood uh, Jim Carrey, The Mask. Mm -hmm. From Zero to Hero, I always wanted to be this guy. Put the mask on, and you become somebody. But it's, a com it's based on a comic book. A lot of fun and uh Cameron Diaz's first film. Hmm. Number 131 is Casino. Yes, I put it before, I put it ahead of Goodfellas. Really enjoy this movie. It becomes like this battle for Vegas between De Niro and Pesci that I love, and Sharon Stone's in the middle. Of course, yes, he just directs his ass off in this film and i love the the way that it begins with the car explosion and then going to the credits it's a fantastic movie and a way better ending than goodfellas nice <laughs> that's just my opinion that's controversial but uh i only have one uh scorsese gangster movie on my list and it's the irishman <laughs> Wow, I think I have all four. But... Yeah, 
No, I mean, that's fair. I considered putting all four, um, but um, I ended up only putting the Irishman. So. Okay, cool. Um, hard. These, these lists are hard. They, they are, because you have so much you want to include that you just kind of really can't. Um, even though I cheated, and I included a lot that you couldn't. You could just be like, yeah, Irish friend and all the others. I, yeah, I, I actually I had that as one slot at one point, but then at, at some point I went through and I was like, you know what? Like a lot of these, what I'm going to do is just like, if I really mean one movie and I'm just including others, I'm going to cut the others and just do the one movie. Now, um, would you include Mean Streets in there? Make it like five crime films? Like, mm. I haven't seen Mean Streets, no. so I don't know. Um, I almost put Mean Streets on here, but I didn't. I'll, I'll have to see it at some point. It's I mean, like, I, I like do it. want it. Yeah. Okay. I have it. Um, this next one, I uh, had a lot of scratching out, so hopefully I can read it pretty well. But my uh, 135 is um, Knights of Cabria, La Dolce Vita, Eight and a Half, and Juliet of the Spirits. Four films by Federico Fellini that tell the story of, his, of him cheating on his wife, Juliet Massana. Masana stars as Cabria in Knights of Cabria. She is a prostitute who everyone inadvertently is extremely rude to, much like Fellini himself. La Dulce Vida stars Marcelo Mastroianni as a paparazzi reporter cheating on his fiancée, who has become caught up in the glitz and glamour of the beautiful people. Marcelo then stars in Eight and a Half as another Fellini insert who reminisces about cheating on his wife and tries to figure out what his next movie should be. Juliet of the Spirit finds Messina starring as a woman with a cheating husband. These four films tell the story of Felina and Messini. The behind-the-scenes story is making their way into the art. All are brilliant films and surprisingly introspective of Fellini's own compulsions and shortcomings. Well said. You got through it. That's a common oh, yeah. theme, though. Yeah, and it's whenever I watch it, I'm just like, I cannot believe you guys are like talking about this, and like she's fucking in them, you know? Like it's not even like <laughs> she's just right there. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> no, sorry. I just... <laughs> Um, number 134 is Midsommar. Ari Aster's quasi-remake of The Wicker Man follows a group of college students lured to an isolated village to witness a traditional Midsommar ritual. Spooky, even though the film mostly takes place in broad daylight, Aster does not hold back on the brutality or the just soft enough penis. Just uh, soft enough to be rated R penis. <laughs> you heard about that, right? No. They had to okay, so like the scene where he runs around like naked for like a minute, they had to reshoot that because they were going to get an NC-17 initially because his penis was too hard. Really? Um, I didn't know that mattered. So, wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, um, it, I, I'm sure it got put in place to avoid having porn be rated R. Um, I'm going to guess that that's where that came from. Now, I don't feel like it's such a, like, I mean, like, I don't know. In Europe, they're doing shit like that all the time. Like, um, uh, Lars von Trier shows, like, full-on penetration in his movies and it's just sort of there um and i and even though i'm not a huge fan of his movies i wouldn't consider them porn like you know they're they're definitely have artistic merit um so i think we could probably re-examine that um ruling at some point but yeah in order to not have the movie be nc-17 they had to reshoot with a softer cock um that would be an interesting yeah. conversation yeah, no. It's like, okay, you're too hard. Imagine a guy with uh, the billboard putting at different levels. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> but uh You can only yeah. be this hard. <laughs> this is the this is the cutoff. <laughs> like, come on, that's ridiculous. No, yeah, it's a, it's a little ridiculous. Okay, um number one thirty three is Carnival oh. of Souls, nineteen sixty two. Um yeah, you had this like last week, I think. Mm -hmm. Um a low-budget film made in Lawrence, Kansas, a young woman survives a car crash and is haunted by specters in an abandoned carnival. Simple yet haunting, a deliciously spooky ghost story. 
I saw a video. I was like, I kind of have a lot of um, 60s horror movies like right in a row. But um, number 132 is The Haunting, 1963. Robert Wise adapts The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. A young woman is invited to take part in a psychic investigation of a haunted house. Psychologically terrifying and inspiration for the Disney ride, The Haunted Mansion. Just a very well done story. That's one of my favorite books. So I was glad that they did a good job with that one. Um, and then number 131 is Spirited Away. Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli present Spirited Away, the story of a young girl who wanders into a world of spirits and witches after her parents turn into pigs. Beautifully animated, whimsical, yet dark, a wonder. Nice. Okay, 130 is one that I didn't like when I first watched it, like, at all. And I was like, oh, Bill Murray is up for an Oscar for this? this why is he up for this? And then, you know, years go by and you it, it grows on you. That is Lost in Translation, where uh, Bill Murray is plays this celebrity and befriends a young woman played by Scarlett Johansson, who's in an unhappy marriage or a happy <laughs> um, relationship. And they kind of take to the cities and they're in japan and they just go around and mess around do karaoke and, and coppola does a great job uh, really she she directs the heck out of it and she does a great job capturing like the the atmosphere mm -hmm. and the loneliness that these characters have and leads to this interesting ending where you're not sure what bill murray told her and stuff like that but it's yeah it's just one of those movies that grows on you mm -hmm. and sticks with you My next one is 129, the one that started it all, Iron Man. Mm -hmm. Starts the started the MCU, Robert Downey Jr. There's a MySpace reference, John Favreau directs, which I think really got him his career going as a director. I mean, he's always good as with swingers, but this really propelled him, you know, in good company with Disney. And yeah, so this started out the MCU as we know it, and just a great fun film. And Jeff Bridges plays a great villain. Yeah. And 128, the one that ended it all 10 years later, Endgame. Uh, fantastic experience. It ties everything together as far as like the first, I guess the Infinity Saga is what they're calling it. Mm -hmm. It ties it, you know, ties it all together with a bow and great performances here. I think Robert Downey Jr. should have been nominated for supporting actor. It was just, it was quite the experience in theaters. 127 is Taxi Driver. Completely change of tone here. Uh, very dark film and sticks with you for sure. Jodie Foster is amazing in this as a uh, prostitute who becomes friends with De Niro's character. One of the darker scenes here is when Sybil Shepard is asked by De Niro to go on a date and he takes her to a, a porno theater and he thinks that's normal. And I just, I always, for some reason, I get a laugh out of that, but it's disturbing too. But it's it's, it's a it's a crazy movie that mm -hmm. you know it's I don't know it's just one of the Scorsese's darkest films. Yeah, one twenty six. Speaking of dark characters, um, Chinatown. My own Polanski. Really enjoy this film. I think it's still influential as far as the filmmaking. Polanski directs the heck a hell out of it. So it's a great noir i don't want to call it modern noir but it's a great noir from the 70s jack nicholson is is great here as a uh, Geddes and faye dunaway is just as good too so it's just a great great movie and plansky is even in the film <laughs> so oh yeah he uh, cuts jack nicholson's nose right exactly uh, all right that's that's the end of my list for this episode cool. wait really one, two, three. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I just have like the next few have multiple movies in the oh, slots. Nice. Three out of three out of the five do. So that's why I was confused. Okay. Um so my number one thirty is uh Curse of Frankenstein, nineteen fifty seven, Horror of Dracula, nineteen fifty eight, and the mummy. 1959. So, the monster are, bundle. 
Yeah. A trilogy of monster movies from Terrence Fisher and Hammer Horror, starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. What did I say there? Innovative reworkings of their source material, replacing the elegance of the Universal monster movies with lurid color and camp. Very fun 50s monster movies. So, yeah, like I was going to originally just do Horror of Dracula because I, I think I do like this one the best of the three. But I think if you kind of like look at the three of them as a whole, they kind of, um, they do like, they, they came out very close together. They're doing very similar things with the source material. They're all like um, playing with it a little bit. And it's the same lead, same director. So I was like, eh, yeah, I think I'll include them all. But Horror of Dracula is the one that I discovered when I was little. So mm -hmm. I have a greater connection with that one. Um, the other two I discovered as an adult. And so, like, I do enjoy them a lot, and I think they're probably just as good as Horror of Dracula. Yeah. But, like, I don't have this, quite the same attachment just because I didn't watch them when I was little. But I watched Horror of Dracula, like, on repeat. That was one of my favorites. Okay. So, turn to page. Number 129 is Galaxy Quest. And Mystery Men. These are joined in the heads of me and my parents. They came out around the same time when we watched them both in the same night. Galaxy Quest is a spoof of Star Trek in which a group of TV actors are mistaken for their on-screen characters by a group of desperate aliens. Mystery Men is a spoof of the superhero genre in which a group of non-superpowered heroes must save their city's captured powered superhero with disastrous results. Yeah, that's, that's a good little feature. Yeah, well, and like Mystery Men didn't do well at the box office, whereas Galaxy Quest did. Always was baffling to me because I think they're of like pretty similar quality. Um, it's just there weren't a lot of superhero movies at the time when Mystery Men came out, and like Mystery Men is a spoof of superhero movies, so like it has aged very well because like mm -hmm. now we have so many superhero movies. And Kino Lover put out a 4K. They did. I have considered getting that, but I'm like, uh, you have the Blu-ray. Do you really need it? And I'm like, maybe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my 128 is Fanny and Alexander, the miniseries cut. Um, Ingmar Bergman's semi-autobiographical Marvel follows siblings Fanny and Alexander through joys and hardships in turn of the century Sweden. Just a beautiful film, gorgeous cinematography and set design, wonderfully drawn characters and situations, and powerful emotions and flights of fancy. An incredible film. The miniseries cut allows us to get see more of Alexander's childhood imaginings and has a slower, more realistic pace that lets us get to know the family better. So the theatrical version is like three hours. The um, television miniseries is 320 minutes. So, <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah, no, but it, um, the first episode, um, is very, it's set at Christmas and it is the most nostalgic Christmassy. I put it on in the background at our um, family game night this Christmas. Um, and uh, yeah, the family, like, I had several people asking me, What is this movie? I really want to like watch the rest of it. Um, cool. That's great. So the number one twenty-seven is um, Scooby Doo two thousand two and Scooby Doo Two Monsters Unleashed. Heck yeah! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> James Gunn written, starring Matthew Lillard, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Freddie Prince Jr., and Linda Cardellini. Wow, what fun live-action Scooby hijinks. Perfectly captures the spirit of the animated show for the big screen. Silly, carefree. I love the spook ale and setting of the first film, and I love that we get to see some of the classic monsters in the second film. So, yeah, these are really fun. I, I enjoy the hell out of them. Um, I recognize they might not be the best movies, but like, I feel like they really are well-done Scooby movies, and like Scooby is very formulaic and not... like. Yeah, I love Scooby Doo, but it's not like good in a certain sense of the word. Like they're just like really goofy and like only make sense if like you squint. Um, other than that, they're just you know like they're a talking dog. I mean, like I I don't actually know the production history, but I feel like somebody must have been high to come up with that. Um, oh, for sure, for sure. And then um, 
126. Um, is a James Mangold uh, is Logan. Uh, James Mangold directs uh, Hugh, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine and Patrick Stewart as Professor X in what was intended to be their last outing as those characters, bringing a dark and brutal Western vibe to the X-Men comic book characters. This is my favorite of those films, and I appreciate that Fox let them go so dark. So yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's mine for uh, this episode. Well done. I think we put out some great movies on this episode. Oh, yeah. 25, a little bit of stuff that we've already covered, but we had a lot of variety. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, man. I, uh, yeah. Guys out there, let us know below your thoughts of this episode, episode five of the top 250. And we'll be back with episode six next week. So be sure to subscribe and like and comment. And uh, peace out, guys. Ha, ha, ha.